Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man tabi'ahum bi isanin ila yawm al-deen Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Okay, so uh, in this session we're going to look briefly at the life of one of the great imams uh, One of the great imams of Islam in general um, And one of the great Hanbalis um, uh, in particular Uh, his name was Abdullah ibn Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Qudama ibn Miqdam ibn Nasr ibn Abdullah al-Maqdisi al-Dimashqi al-Salihi. He was al-Faqih. These were some of his titles here, if you're following along in the reading there. Al-Faqih, which of course is a jurist. Zahid, as you should know. Zahid is from Zuhud, meaning someone that uh, abstains from worldly pursuits and... Um, impulses. He was Al Imam, Sheikh al Islam. He was given the honor of that title. Uh, one of the luminaries, he was known as Muwafiq al Din Abu Muhammad. Was born in Sha'ban, the year 541 of the Hijra calendar in Jamma'il, which is located in Palestine. His lineage can be traced back to Omar ibn Khattab. Radiallahu anhu. So, uh, born in 541 of the Hijra calendar, during this year of his birth was the time that the second wave of the Crusades was launched from Europe. To give you some context of what happens, a lot of times when we look at uh, Islamic history, we tend to put it in a bubble, as if it's as if it's like insulated from the rest of the world, almost as if it's like this fairy tale of sorts. Um, so to understand, you know, sort of what happens to the imam and where he ends up, you have to kind of get the context of his, of his situation. So the second wave of crusades was launched, and this was mainly led by Louis VII, who was the king of France, and Conrad III, who was the king of Germany. Uh, and they had a number of other European leaders that marched alongside of them through Europe uh, and essentially were going to, um, you know, what the Crusades were all about. It was a holy war. Uh, they did suffer a number of defeats at the hands of the Turks. They, however, made their way down to Jerusalem. They were able to overcome that area and led an attack on Damascus. This was an ill-advised plan to attack Damascus. And of course, they were unsuccessful. They ended up retreating. But this wave here, this second crusades and this wave on Damascus and the general area had an impact on the eventual fall of Jerusalem during the third crusade. So because of their presence in Jerusalem, the crusaders at the age of 10, led by his father, Ahmed, alongside his brother-in-law. So Ahmed, the father, and Ahmed's brother-in-law, who was named Abdul Wahid ibn Ali. You should recognize Abdul Wahid ibn Ali from Abdul Ghani ibn Abdul Wahid. So this is Abdul Ghani al maqdisis dad. So Ibn Qudama's father and Abdul Ghani's father, they both made their way um, towards Damascus along with their family. They relocated as refugees and they settled in the village of as -Saliha. So as -Saliha, it, it wasn't known as that at that time. Uh, Salihiyya was a um, was a desolate region. It was like the wilderness. It could be considered like a wasteland. There was nothing really there. It's located to the northwest of the old walled city of Damascus at the foot of Mount Qasiyun. So to the southwest is Al Muhajirin, and to the northeast is Ruknuddin. These are areas. I want to say similar to large neighborhoods or small townships. Um, and Salihiyah was right there between these two. And the reason that I mentioned these two neighboring areas is because um, they would eventually benefit from uh, the presence of Al-Maqadisa, which was the Maqdisi family uh, in Salihiyah. So as I said, when they moved there was nothing. It was like empty land. They began to build up the area. Uh, 
constructing homes and, and various different important infrastructure there, masjid, for example, school, businesses, and eventually it became one of the most important neighborhoods or regions in Damascus. And when you look at this, you can see um, what they were able to do, able to accomplish within a generation, is testament to the potential of what immigrants and refugees can have on their new communities. They leave behind everything, they move into another place, and they can do one of two things. They can just sit and do nothing and just, you know, be upset and uh, sad, the fact that they had to leave, or they can roll up their sleeves and they can dig in with the rest of the people and leave a positive impact. That was the way of this family, and it certainly was the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who of course left his home in Mecca in order to set up a new community in Medina. And perhaps, following in his footsteps, Alayhi Salatu Wasalam, this is what inspired the Maqadisa in order to take such an active role in establishing not only the masjid there, which we're going to talk about, but also the school, which is the infamous al madrasatul al-Umariyah, which we'll also talk about shortly. Uh, so it basically that's where he got set up. Eventually they ended up in that area and they began their life in Damascus. Before the age of puberty, Ibn Qudamah, he completed the memorization of the Quran as well as Mukhtasar al-Khiraqi. So this is a textbook. Mukhtasar al-Khiraqi, which basically um, is um, a small text, a legal text in the Hanbali Madhab. Uh, Mukhtasar al-Khiraqi was authored by Omar. Ibn al-Husayn al-Khiraqi, who died in 334 of the Hijra calendar. Um, the author here, Omar al-Khiraqi, he was guided to the madhab of Imam Ahmed by his father, Abu Ali Khiraqi. And he knew the two sons of Imam Ahmed. Imam Ahmed had a son named Salih and one named Abdullah. He learned from them. And he was also a student of Abu Bakr al-Marwadi, Harb al-Kirmani, and Abu Bakr al-Khalal. These were three of Imam Ahmed's uh, students as well. So uh, basically, you know, he's, he's, he's drinking from the spring. Um, Imam al-Khiraqi is, is, is drinking and being nourished from the spring of Imam Ahmed from the hands of his most, uh, I guess, personal students, if you will. Now, he authored uh, Mukhtasar al-Khidaqi. It's, it's likely, it's said that he, he authored that book when the black stone was in the possession of the Qaramiqa. This was the Ismaili Shi'a sect. Um, and uh, the reason that some have... Thank you very much. The reason that some have... Um, come to this conclusion is because when it comes to the mannerism of Tawaf, in his book he wrote, then a person comes to the black stone and touches it if it is present. They touch the black stone if it's present. Meaning that it might not be present. If it's present, it's an indication that he wrote it when the black stone was in the possession of Qaramita, who forcefully took the black stone during Hajj in the year 317 of the Hijra calendar and didn't return it back to its rightful place until 339. The text, uh, Mukhtasar al-Khiraqi, represents the first work, which is concise, but fully comprehensive of the jurisprudence in the Hanbali school. And so it holds a very special place within the corpus of Hanbali legal literature. Mukhtasar al-Khiraqi is like, it's like the, 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 the it's like the, it's like the Constitution, right? It's like the Constitution. It's like the Bill of Rights. It's like that was, that's the forefathers. They pinned that down. And then uh, from that day forward, it's always referred to and utilized in some form or fashion. Holds a very special place within the corpus of the legal code in the Hanbali school to the point that approximately 300 commentaries were written about it. It's a small manual. It's not something like that you would see in front of you. What you see in front of you in these volumes, this is a visual aid I brought for you, is what Ibn Qudamah ended up writing, which is the greatest and one of the most important and distinguished commentaries of all time of 
Mukhtasar al Khiraqi. And this is called Al Mughni. It's famous. It's probably more famous than Mukhtasar al Khiraqi is. Many people would recognize the name Al Mughni as the title of a book before they would Mukhtasar al Khiraqi. But Al Mughni is an explanation of that book written by Imam al Khiraqi. Uh, and this text, believe it or not, uh, not Al Mughni, but uh, Mukhtasar Al Khiraqi, was translated in the early 90s into English language by Dr. Anis Khalid. This was a part of his PhD requirements, Graduate School of Arts and Science, University, uh, excuse me, New York University. You can find that available if you're interested. You can see just how concise it is, which leads to the depth of scholarship that Ibn Qudamah poured into his explanation or his commentary because. Um, you're looking at right here, it, they, they used to say it was 10 volumes, this has been put into 9 volumes. Um, and this is an old print, it's not like the new prints where they give you lots of space, big letters, spaced out, lots of white to really buff it out, you know, get a huge gigantic one. This is the older classic type print, letters are small, uh, there's no designs, there's no big margins, it's, so it's in there pretty tight. So Imam ibn Qudam, his initial exposure to Islamic studies was at the hand of his father. His father's name, of course, Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Qudama. Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Qudama. His father was a righteous scholar. He was famous for knowledge and worship. He also served as the khatib of the masjid in Jamma'ir. And this, of course, was before their migration to Damascus. And this was the family tradition seeking knowledge and serving the community, delivering the khutbah from the time of his great-grandfather, Qudama ibn Miqdad. And that's where the family name comes from, Qudama. So ibn Qudama is in reference to not his father, not his grandfather, but his great-grandfather. And there's a reason for that. That's because Qudama was the first of the family to be introduced to the Hanbali school and to begin a serious path of knowledge. So while he was in Jamma'il, they were visited by Abu Faraj, Abdul Wahid, and Muhammad al Shirazi. And he came to the area to spread the school of Imam Ahmad. Ibn Qudama actually reports this himself. He says that we are all being blessed by Abu Faraj. He came to our region in the Holy Land and he was the talk of the town. So people came from all over the region to see him. My grandfather, or I should say great-grandfather, Qudama, said to his brother, let's go and visit this sheikh, and maybe he'll pray for us. So they went. Qudama stepped forward, addressing Abu Faraj, and he said, he said, Ya Sayyidi, which is like my leader, my master, Pray for me that Allah will bless me to memorize the Qur'an. And so he did. He prayed for him. His brother, on the other hand, didn't ask for anything, and so he remained as he was. So here, it's as if Ibn Qudama is saying that his great-grandfather was blessed, and that sent him on this journey, whereas his great uncle, if you will, was left behind of sorts. After his father passed away, his father passed away when Ibn Qudam was 17 years old. His older brother, whose name was Abu Umar, Muhammad Ibn Ahmad, he took over teaching him. So he first started learning from his father, and then he was learning from his older brother. His older brother, Abu Umar, was the one that established the renown Al-Madrasa al umariya when he became the patriarch of the family, after the passing of his father, he took over and he established the school. And the school ended up being the largest in the area and was eventually expanded with the aid of numerous supporters. Uh, and from those supporters were those of the ruling class. The school became large enough to hold 1,300 students on site living in what would be today considered a dormitory. So they built these little apartments alongside of the school and people would come from all over to stay and study and they would stay in those apartments 
The students were given food. They said that they would be given a thousand loaves of bread a day. That's how many students were there. And they were also given a stipend. The students were. It was like a modern day university. There's various fields of study that were available. It's like different faculties were available. And there were different levels so that a person could enter and uh, they could join the school right away. It wasn't like there was a four-year program that you'd have to wait till the end of the four years. No, it was a constantly running program with turnover, graduations, all that type of a thing that was happening constantly at this particular school. Ibn Qudam, however, at a young age, he was noted to be very hardworking, and he had impeccable handwriting, which is important during the time there's no printing press. And that's something that is often noted about the scholars of that era, uh, how their handwriting was, because a lot of, you know, they're writing their books down, and also many of them worked as copiers. They would copy textbooks and sell them. That was a, a way to earn a livelihood. Somebody wanted a copy of Muhtasar al-Khiraqi, for example, they'd have to go down to the, uh, sometimes it was a maktaba, a library of sorts, and they would find these uh, copiers for hire. And there would be the main copy, and they'd say, I want a copy of Muhtasar al-Khiraqi. They would hire the, the guy, and he would take however long uh, it took to copy the book, and then you'd have your own hand-copied textbook. And that's how things circulated during that time. And that was a way for uh, many mashayikh and scholars to earn a wage. It's a way for many of them to earn a wage. So they would copy the textbook, you would pay for that copy. It's not that they were selling the knowledge, but they were being hired out for their skill and ability to copy a textbook. Maybe you might think of it like uh, somebody selling a book today that they've translated or uh, maybe even that they've authored, uh, you're going to get a copy of that book and you're going to pay for it and it's a way for that particular person to earn a wage to continue supporting what it is that they're doing. Uh, as opposed to, for example, um, always looking for free uh, PDFs and downloads and um, you know trying to uh, convert things and copies and stuff like that. I think that's an important thing to note here. Uh, so throughout his career as a student, he had numerous teachers, as the great scholars did. Some have said that he had approximately 32 teachers or so. Uh, they included uh, Abu al-Mukarim ibn Hilal, Abu al-Ma'ali ibn Sabir, Ibtullah al-Daqaq, ibn al-Batti, Abu al-Fat, Muhammad, ibn Abdul baqi Sa'adullah al-Dajjaji, Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, we'll talk about shortly, Ibn Taj al-Farra, Ibn Shafi' Abu Zuhra, Yahya Ibn Thabit al-Mubarak, Ibn Khudayr, Abu Bakr, Ibn Naqur, al-Mubarak, Ibn Tabbakh, Abu al-Fadl, Abdullah Ibn Ahmad al-Tusi, Ibn al-Manni, who was Abu al-Fatih, Nasr, Ibn Futian, Ibn Matar, Abu al-Faraj, Abdul Rahman, Ibn al-Jawzi, uh, Shuhda bint Ahmad, Ibn al-Faraj, and Khadija bint Ahmad, and Nahruwaniya. So you can see there, he learned from the majority of his scholars, his teachers were male. But he did have some uh, female teachers as well. So uh, these that I mentioned represent the heavyweights of his time. Some from different regions, some in different fields uh, of study, uh, but all of them in the service of Islam and Islamic scholarship. And of course, when you look at this, it highlights the traditional way of seeking sacred knowledge. The traditional way is done by seeking out teachers who will pass down the religion. They will pass it down to you and they will guide you along the way. There's nothing wrong with reading books, but it's best done with a trained teacher so that you don't come to mistaken conclusions. There's also something that gets passed down when uh, in the presence of a teacher, 
and also with students, living together and studying, and that is etiquette and manner has to be developed and learned. And that's how a person respects and holds in high esteem uh, the tradition and those that are involved in preserving and, 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 and transmitting it, is to observe the proper protocols and etiquettes, uh, which would be like a prerequisite, really, before you began your journey in seeking Islamic knowledge. You would learn some basic etiquettes and manners in order to fit in with um, uh, the setting. So that was his initial introduction to Islamic knowledge with his father, with his older brother, with the uh, scholars of his, of his region. Uh, but in 561, at the age of 20, alongside his cousin, Al-Hafid Abdul Ghani Al-Maqdisi, he traveled to Baghdad to learn from its scholars. So Al-Hafid Abdul Ghani, of course, we know his father migrated with Ibn Qudama's father. And we've talked about Al-Hafid Abdul Ghani Al-Maqdisi, he passed away in the year 600. His lineage traces back to Jafar ibn Abi Talib. Anhu. He was older than Ibn Qudama by a few months. He also began his studies under the supervision of Ibn Qudama's father, Ahmed. And he was famous for his work in the field of hadith and the related sciences of hadith. Some of his most famous works include Al Kamal fi Asma' Rijal. This is a book. It's considered the first of its kind in that it analyzes the narrators of the six books of hadith, meaning Al-Bukhari, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Sunnah Abi Dawood, Sunnah Tirmidhi, uh, Sunnah Ibn Majah, excuse me, Sunnah Nasa'i and Sunnah Ibn Majah. Those are the six major works of hadith. And in that book, um, uh, Abdul Ghani, he basically analyzed the narrators uh, in a nutshell. In a nutshell, he analyzed the narrators of those six books and it became a book that was relied upon uh, throughout the ages up until this very day it's left an impact on the science of hadith he also wrote umdatul ahkam this may be more well known to people it's a very small book of hadith um, and the hadith in there have to do with religious rulings umdatul ahkam which would be like the mainstay of rulings if we translated the title the mainstay or the pillar of rulings and basically, it gives you all the hadith which are typically used when looking at things like uh, wudu and salah and hajj and zakat and um, various other things like uh, marriage and divorce and transaction, etc. Um, crime and punishment, all those types of things. And that small work of hadith, uh, you'll find this is the compilation of hadith related to that. And uh, many of those hadith are used throughout the works of the Hanabila. He also authored, authored the short biography of the Prophet and his Ten Companions, which you would recognize because that's a course that we've taken here uh, not too long ago. Uh, and of course, if you're more interested in uh, Al-Hafid Abdul Ghani Al-Maqdisi, uh, you can find, as I said, a short biography, about 20-some minutes, uh, is available on, on the YouTube channel. And I will leave that uh, in a link here on this, on this recording, inshallah. Uh, so when they, went to, um, when they went to Baghdad, it was there that he met and studied with the master and saint Abdul Qadir al-Jilani. Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, I'm not even going to try and, and offer a, a, a synopsis of who he is. The name is, is, is I almost want to say like a household name to uh, a, a, a veteran Muslim, if you will. Passed away in 561. Uh, his status is, um, is quite up there. He was called Tajul Arifin. Taj al-Arifin. Al-Arifin are those Gnostics, the, um, those of religious and spiritual insight, if you will. And Taj is the crown. So he was called the crown of the Gnostics. He was called Qutb Baghdad. Qutb means uh, like Sayyid, if you will. It's the one that everyone follows. All of the issues and affairs and al-masail kullaha taduru alayhi. That's Qutb Baghdad. So he was like the leader of Baghdad. Um, uh, he had a number of other titles, Muhyiddin, etc. Um, but those give us an idea of his status. And so it was under his tutelage that Ibn Qudama studied Mukhtasar al Khiraqi and attended his lessons until he passed away. And that was 
a short time. It was approximately 50 days after first contact. But it was said it was enough time, he spent enough time with Abdul Qadir al-Jilani to receive the bulk, if not all, of his knowledge. And then after that, he remained close to Ibn al-Manni and recited the Hanbali school to him along with Khilaf, which is like differences of opinion, and Usul, until he became an expert. So Ibn al-Manni is, as I mentioned before, Abu al-Fatih, Nasr, Ibn al-Futyan, Ibn al-Matar, he died 583. He was known as Ibn al-Manni. That was what everyone called him, like Ibn Qudama is known to us today. He was the sheikh of the Hanabila of his time. He was known to be a pious worshiper. He had excellent manners. He was upon the way of the Salaf. He was a profound teacher who had many students and he taught all the way up to his death. So you're seeing some of the, 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 the legacy, if you will, of Ibn Qudamah, where he comes from, the level of scholarship, uh, the influence from great masters, tutelage under these, these um, illuminaries of our tradition. According to uh, his nephew, Al-Hafiz Diyauddin Al-Maqdisi, this is the nephew of Ibn Qudama, he returned to Baghdad, excuse me, he remained in Baghdad for a total of four years until he returned to Damascus. And then after returning home, he took up a post in the Damascus Mosque. So this is, this is the, uh, the main mosque of, of, uh, of Damascus, uh, which is Al-Jami Al-Umawi. Eventually, he became the Imam of the Hanbalis, and he would lead the people in prayer when he was in town. After his older brother, Abu Omar, passed away, he became the Imam of the al mudaffari Masjid. al mudaffari Masjid was built by his family at the foot of Mount Qasiyun. This was the Masjid that they built, and he would deliver the Friday sermons whenever he was there. So the mudaffari Masjid is also known as Jami' al Hanabila. And it's still standing until this very day. And it was built in the likeness of the Masjid of Damascus. It's like a miniature version in its layout and some of its, I say, the bulk of its design. Um, and so it's kind of an ode to that Jam al Umawi, if you will. This was um, constructed with not only the support of the Maqadisa, their, their family, but also. Um, from the ruling party uh, who would offer significant financial support to the point that they gave enough financial support to develop a waqf, which was an endowment, which basically was like some businesses that would run and the proceeds would go to the masjid expenses. Um, so that was a, a kind of a model that was utilized from very early on to develop these endowments in order to support uh, communal projects, religious projects. Um, and um, that's typically what was done then if a, someone from the ruling party or someone very wealthy would come in and they would establish a masjid or a madras or something, they would also add a waqf to it so that it could be uh, self-perpetuating, self-sufficient, or at least uh, it would have a, a foundation of financial uh, support. Eventually, this was 574 in the Hijra County, he traveled to Mecca to perform Hajj, and then accompanied a travel party to Baghdad. He went back, remained there for a year attending the lessons of Ibn al-Manni. So he went back to a sheikh in Baghdad. When he returned from that trip to Damascus, he began authoring Al-Mughni. So after some time learning, studying, mastering, becoming licensed, recognized as an expert, he began to author this book that we see in front of us here, Al-Mughni, Explanation of Mukhtasar Al-Khiraqi. And he exerted a great deal of focus on perfecting the work. Um, as I mentioned, it comprised of 10 volumes and is recognized as one of the most comprehensive fiqh books of its kind. Not only does it showcase the Hanbali school, but it provides comparative studies of the other schools as well. So when you were to look at al mughni if you were to pick it up and read through it, you find like one of the first issues about Bahara, you would see that Imam al-Qudama, 
he is basically going to use Muqtasar al-Khiraqi as, as the, the foundational text. He's going to go through that, but he's going to stop at every issue, and then he will break down the issue based on the other madhahib. Imam Abu Hanifa and the Hanafis, they say this, and Imam Malik, he said this, and Imam Maliki, they say this, and Imam Shafi'i, he said this, and this is Al Qadim and Al Jadid, and the Shafi'i, they conclude this, and uh, the Hanabila, they say this, and they're all wrong except for us because of this. I mean, essentially. Because he's going he's gonna, to, obviously, he's, he's authoring this for the Hanabila, but. It collects everything, presents everything, uh, talks about evidence that's used and utilized, argues the evidence, and then he comes to his conclusions. Now, Imam Ibn Qudama, obviously a great Hanbali scholar, he is uh, a part of the uh, middle era. Hanabila are three eras. There's the Al-Mutaqaddimin, Al-Mutawassitin, and there's Mutaakhirin. So there's the, the initial era, and then there's the middle era, and then there's the latter, latter era, and he's right there in the middle. Um, and what we've come to know of the Hanbali Madhab today is reliant upon the previous two, but the final conclusions are with Al-Muta'akhirin. And so you'll find that um, Ibn Qudama had um, his own ikhtiarat at times, occasionally. Um, he had his own conclusions uh, that were within the framework of the, the school, from the usul of the school, so it wasn't like he's going far away. Um, uh, but that was the caliber of the man. He was able to do that, rahimahullah ta'ala. However, um, uh, this work is a relied upon work. Um, it's not one that's studied as a, as, a, as a part of a curriculum, but it is a reference work. It's used and referred to frequently, and um, throughout our classes here, um, it's been a point of reference for me in preparation, and I have mentioned uh, some of the conclusions from time to time of Imam al Qudam as supportive evidence for the things that we're talking about. So you'll be hearing that probably likely into the future. And now you'll know exactly when the word al mughni is mentioned, you'll know it's talking about this work um, of Islamic law. Uh, it was noted that he was a man of piety and worship. He took to the study of fiqh and knowledge in general. His daily habit was to recite one-seventh of the Qur'an, which means that he would complete the Qur'an every seven days, along with everything that he was doing. Right? His, his teaching, his studying, his etc. He was also praying and reading the Qur'an. And although he noted that his father and brother surpassed him in worship, okay, and, and rightly so, I mean, with the amount of uh, work that he produced, you could understand why that is. Um, he was regular in voluntary prayers, and other than on a few occasions, would reserve them for his home in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu so This is a point of fiqh, is that the Prophet والسلام, this is found in Sahih al-Bukhari, there's a couple of hadith that we could, um, we could utilize here. Prophet Sallallahu says, pray, O people, in your homes. The most virtuous of prayers, uh, the prayer of a man in his home, except for the prescribed prayers. This is found in Sahih al-Bukhari. And then in Sunnah Abi Dawood, there's another hadith that says, Salatul Mar'i fi bayti afdalu min salatihi fi masjidi hadha illa al-maktuba. That the prayer of a man in his house is more rewarding than his prayer in masjidi hadha, meaning my masjid, the Prophet's masjid, illa al-maktuba, except for the prescribed prayers. And then we'll find in Sharh al-Muntaha, which of course is the, one of the uh, primary reference works for the Hanbali school today, the author, he says, وَفِعْلُ sunani al-kulli al-rawatibi wal-witri wa ghayriha bibaytin afdal so here is to perform the uh, sunnah prayers, all of them, the rawatib and the witr and all of the others in the house is more virtuous than performing them in the masjid. Based on the hadith, the Prophet said, basically saying, pray in your homes 
The best prayer of a man is in their home, except for the obligatory prayer. This hadith is found Sahih Muslim. However, the exception is noted here. What's been legislated to pray in congregation is an exception for this. So like Taraweeh, it's better to pray in the masjid. Yambari an yustatna naflu al takif as well, which is um, if you're a mu'atak, if you're making it to kaf, you're in the masjid, you have to say it's an exception to pray in the masjid because you're not going to run back and forth home to make your nawafil, even if you lived right next door. It was noted that he had a beautiful voice from reciting the Quran, Ibn Qudama. He loved the impoverished, the poor. He would regularly invite them to his home for dinner after Isha. And this, we could say, is inspired by the Prophet It was noted, uh, this is the hadith collected by Imam Ahmad. This is related by uh, Abu Dhar. He says, Qala amrani khaliri, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bi sab'in. Amrani bi hubb al-masakin. Wa danuwi minhum. Wa amrani an anbura ila man huwa duni. Wa la anbura ila man huwa fawqi. As my friend, my close friend and companion, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is Abu Dhar. He said he commanded me with seven things. He commanded me to love the poor and to get close to them. And he commanded me to look at those below me, or I should say lesser than me, and to not look at those above me in terms of worldly means, status. Look at those less fortunate. Do not look at those that are more fortunate. And there were other things that he mentioned as well. He says, commanded me to join the family ties, even if they pull away. Commanded me to not ask anything of anyone. Commanded me to speak the truth, even if it was bitter. Commanded me not to fear anyone except for Allah, regardless who it was. He commanded me to say abundantly, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. For these are from the treasures below Al Arsh, which would translate as Al Arsh, the throne. Another narration it says, kenzun min kunuz il Jannah. That it is a treasure from the treasures of paradise, as I said, collected by Imam Ahmad. So that was his way. He would invite the poor people to come and eat dinner with him after Salat al Aisha. He was well-mannered, very affable, meaning he was a likable guy. He was a likable guy. He always had a smile on his face. He told stories and he made jokes. When the people studied with him, he was often cheerful, lighthearted, very relaxed. At one point, they complained about him to some of the kids, those that were studying with him, and he said, they're children, they have to play. You used to be just like them. I mean, they were playing, they were creating noise and disruption. And so he was keeping things light. Note a similar character with the Prophet ﷺ. He was also reported to be easygoing. The Prophet ﷺ would smile often, and on the occasion he would joke with his companions and keep things light. So the reason that these things are mentioned, it's important to note because the scholars of Islam, uh, their pursuit of knowledge is not purely academic. It's not to gain facts and information, to flex a mental muscle, um, uh, to have titles and degrees, uh, and put them on the wall and advertise them. Uh, but it is to apply that knowledge. And that's the pinnacle of, of beneficial knowledge is righteous action. Without it, it's worthless. In fact, it could be worse, that you know, you know better, you don't do better, right? And so you find that the true scholars, the sincere scholars were the ones that they ended up with a character, a disposition that was similar to the Prophet ﷺ because they were dedicated to studying his life and to studying the revelation. And so their dedication meant that there was implementation, there was practice. So it wasn't just reading, writing, debating, issuing fatawa, but it was 
prayer, reciting Quran, it was good manners, it was mixing with people, it was um, guiding people in a, in, a, in a positive manner. So that was what we can see from a couple of these descriptions that we can find from the earliest sources, those that lived with him and observed him and, um, and, and noted those things down. This quality, by the way, of being lighthearted and, and cheerful, smiling was, a no, was even noted uh, that he would, he would display this quality when he was debating. And some said that he would slay his opponent with his smile. Debating was something that he did at one point in his career. Uh, sessions were typically held after Juma prayer in the Masjid of Damascus, uh, but he eventually gave that up at the end of his life. He stopped those, those it was like a discourse. I wouldn't say a debate, but a discourse. People would come and they would engage in discourse with him. And um, he, he stopped doing that and he moved on to other things. As a teacher, he was busy. He had people all around him all the time from early morning until the sun rose after Dhuhr. Uh, they would either read hadith or they would read his works to him. And this would go until Maghrib prayer. On some occasions, they would read it to him after Maghrib while he was eating dinner. So he would be eating, and they're reading to him, you know, right? And through all of that, he never appeared annoyed or weary. He wasn't worried. He, wasn't, he didn't appear to be stressed or irritated by that. He would not complain to anyone about it, although it likely took a toll. The rigor of that teaching schedule took a toll, likely, on him, but he kept doing it and did not turn anyone away. He was fully reliable, meaning thiqa, in his narrations, in his transmissions. He was considered an evidence. Because of his reliability, if he said it, it was. It was trusted. He was noble, possessed many virtues. He kept away from anything unbecoming. Again, he was upon the way of the Salaf. Light and dignity could be seen upon him, and it was noted that a man would take benefit from seeing him even before hearing his speech. He was very courageous, and he fought the Crusaders under the command of Salahuddin al-Ayyubi. He engaged in combat himself and sustained a wound to his hand. So in the year 583, when Salahuddin mobilized the troops to fight the Crusaders, Ibn Khudama, alongside his brother Abu Omar and his cousin, Abdul Ghani al maqdisi and who I believe was the brother-in-law, Al-Imad al maqdisi they fought. They went into battle, and they were victorious, reconquering Jerusalem and the shores of Palestine. And while in the army, he would hold lighthearted conversations with the soldiers and try to lift their spirits, keeping up morale. And even during those circumstances, while there, he was noted to be in worship regularly. He was an imam in tafsir and hadith, an imam in fiqh like no other, an imam in khilaf. He was a master like no other in fara'id, which fara'id is um, inheritance, law of inheritance. He was an imam in usul al-fiqh, an imam in nahu, also, also mathematics and astronomy. And he was granted the title of Shaykh al-Islam. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Qudama came before, much before Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, just so you can have an idea of like a timeline. And Shaykh, Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah recognized um, and, and uh, celebrated the status of Ibn Qudama, saying that there was none like him uh, during his time in, uh, in Damascus. He was unmatched. He was a full height, light skin tone, he had a bright face, large distinct eyes, he was so handsome that it was as if his face gave off light. He had a broad forehead and a long beard. He had a straight nose and his eyebrows joined. He had a small head, slender arms and legs, and a thin body. He had a full, sense of it. He had a full use of his senses and faculties. He was extremely intelligent with fine manners. So obviously he's healthy. He's a healthy guy, you can see. Good looking guy, healthy guy. He's taking care of himself. He was also known for karamat. Karamat are wonders. It's not something that people talk about a lot because a lot of times people get like a little weirded out, you know. Karamat are like, they're not mu'jizah. Mu'jizah is what the prophets get of like miracles. But karamat are similar 
in that they are violations of convention. We talked about this with Qala'ad al Aqiyan, Karamat. So, wonders is what we're calling wonders to distinguish them from miracles. Wonders of the saints, they are real. They are rationally sound as they have been witnessed and attested for, as well as they are religiously acceptable. Imam Ahmed rebuked anyone who denied them and declared them to have gone astray. To deny the karamat. He said the person had gone astray. They're violations of convention. That's what a karam is. Not something which is summoned. Meaning the person doesn't seek the karama. And it doesn't serve as a challenge like a mu'jiza. A mu'jiza is a challenge to those that would try and disprove the prophet's authenticity. They're challenging them with that, with that mu'jiza. But the karama is not like that. It doesn't serve as this type of challenge. And it's not an invitation to the producer, the one that produces the karama, nor is that something summoned from him on behalf of himself or Allah. The absence of such wonders do not detract from the status of sainthood. So a person can be a wali, min awliya illah, and never have been noted uh, or observed uh, to have uh, any karamat. They're given. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives uh, to some and not to others. So legitimate wonders occur from those who have knowledge, who are knowledgeable of Allah and His, and His attributes to the best of their ability. Uh, these are a couple of the, the qualities, if you will, of what the karama is. Um, They're regularly obedient and refrain from sin. So those are a couple of qualities that one would possess that you would, that you would uh, associate a karama with. Uh, and they're not preoccupied with worldly pleasures or desires, be they male or female. And they typically are noted to conceal those karamat. They would conceal them. They would not talk about them. They were not comfortable with them. It was actually a point of discomfort that it happened, uh, a point of worry that those things would happen. However, they did happen, and they were noted from time to time by other people. It was reported that Abu Abdullah bin Fadl al-Ataki said, I told myself, this is a karama, this is an example of it. He says, I told myself that if I had the capacity, I would have built a school for muwafiq and given him a thousand dirhams as a daily wage. If I had the capacity, meaning if I had the money and the resources, I would have built him a school and I would have paid him a thousand dirhams every day. He said, after a few days, I went to him and gave him salam. And he looked at me and smiled and then he said, when someone intends something, its reward will be recorded. So, the insinuation here is that Muwafiq, he knew what Abu Abdullah ibn Fadl intended before he told him about his, his intention. Another one here is Abu Hassan ibn Hamdan al-Jarahi said, I used to despise the Hanbalis. Is an enemy, an opponent here. Due to what was said about their evil doctrine, meaning they had su'al aqidah, su'al atiqat. That was what was said about the Hanabilas, they had bad, bad aqidah. We're going to talk about that too, so no problem. At some point, I fell ill, he said, and the sickness caused my limbs to cramp to the point that I was unable to move for 17 days. I hoped for death. At the Aisha time, Al Muwafiq came to visit me and recited a number of verses over me and said, this is a verse, Surah Al-Isra, verse number 82, it means, and we sent down the Qur'an, that which is a cure for mankind and a mercy for the faithful. He wiped over my back, and I felt well and was able to stand up. I told my servant to open the door for him, but he said, I'll go from where I came. He disappeared. I got up and went to the washroom. When I got up in the morning time, I went to the masjid and prayed Fajr behind Al-Muwafiq. He was leading the prayer. Then I shook his hand. He squeezed my hand. And he said, be wary of saying anything. Meaning, don't go telling people what happened. Remember, we, we talked about that. Ibn, Ibn Balban mentions, or it's, it's maybe not Ibn Balban, I can't re recollect Ibn Qala'id. However, but this was the quality of the awliya, is they, they didn't want to talk about these karamat. They didn't want it spreading. They didn't want it getting around. He says, be wary of saying anything. I said, meaning this is, the narrator here, he says, this is Abu Hassan, he says, I will say, I will say, meaning I'm going to tell people, I'm going to tell them. Like, I have to tell them. If you remember, he was an opponent 
So now he's, it's like an, an, an awakening of sorts. It's like an aha moment. Wait a minute, muwafiq? This is a karama? And we have this ill opinion of, of the Hanabila? But this, is, this can't be right if he's min awliya illah. So we have to, he's like, I have to go and like, it's almost like I have to go and withdraw and retract and now make amends for what, you know, whatever was said and done. There were other reports by more than one person that they saw him walk on water. To the point they asked, were his feet under the water? As if there was something under there and he was just walking. And they said, no, they were not under the water. Again, some people may shy away from these things. Um, preferring the magic of Harry Potter, which is Hollywood and special effects, to the Karamat al -Awliyat. Ibn Qudama authored a number of great books. Some estimate that he authored approximately 40 works in the school on the topics of both law and doctrine. His works on doctrine are considered excellent, the majority of which are authorized, authored, excuse me, utilizing the methodology of the Hadith scholars and filled with hadith narrations and chains of transmissions. We're going to discuss this shortly in a minute. He also authored books in the fields of hadith, uh, Nahu and Zuhud. So language and Zuhud. He did not take to theological rhetoric, and this is known as Ilmul Kalam. And he would not debate with such theologians regarding the nuances of theology, even to refute them. So this was something prevalent during that time. It was prevalent during the time of Imam Ahmed. And that's what arose, the, uh, led to the mihna, the great uh, trial that Imam Ahmed had to face, uh, was the introduction of philosophy, etc., into the ranks of the Muslims. And then things started getting a little bit cloudy and, and, and um, new ideas sprung up. According to Imam Ibn Rajab, Ibn Rajab, he said, they, the hadith masters, adhered strongly to what was reported in the area of doctrine and would not utilize language that was not found in those reports. Instead, they would order that there be affirmation, this is al-iqrar, and relegation of what had come in the book and sunnah regarding the attributes without tafsir, without explanation, without takif. Takif is to um, basically assign modality or how something is. Tamthil, which means to assign likeness. There's a method. There's something like this. Like, Allah's attribute is like this. They would not do that. Or tahrif, which means uh, to change. Uh, it's meaning to another. A ta'wil is to assign some type of interpretation. Or ta'til, which is to negate the meaning altogether. Um, uh, ta'til is to negate the meaning. Okay? To say that there is no meaning. So Imam Ibn Qudamah was, when it came to uh, the works of doctrine, he approached them with this methodology. This methodology um, is known as the, the Hadith scholars of Al-Hanabila. Al-Hadith min Al-Hanabila. It should be noted that the Hanbali scholars have written works on Aqidah from very early on. They were collected by reports of Imam Ahmad. Right? For example, um, Usul al-Sunnah. There's a book that's available, it's even translated. Uh, these are the sayings of Imam Ahmed in regards to Islamic doctrine. And the works continue to be authored over the ages from al mutaqaddimin and al mutawassitin and al mutaakhirin these three eras. There were many works that were authored. And there are two basic approaches to the subject. The first, mentioned by Ibn Rajib, the approach of the Hanbali Hadith scholars. And this approach was utilized by the majority of the early era. Some in the middle and some in the latter era utilized this approach. This methodology does not utilize intellectual arguments which have, been, which have not been related through sound narrations. Okay, so in the Quran and in the Hadith there are intellectual arguments. Allah asks us or commands us to use our intellect to look and to observe and to ponder and to reflect and you can see there's some intellectual argumentation and reasoning happening. And so this was the type of argumentation that they would employ in authoring their works. 
that which was related and reported. They relied solely on intellectual evidence that was reported. The practitioners of this methodology did not delve into the nuances of theological debate and rhetoric, ilm al-kalam, and would only address the required issues of sound doctrine, meaning they wouldn't talk about unnecessary things, what they viewed it was not reported. They would only talk about that which was reported. And this can be found in works like Usul al-Sunnah, like I mentioned, Al-Ibana, which was by Ibn Batta. He wrote Al-Kubra and Al-Sughra, which is the big and the small. Al-Ibana, you find that type of methodology there. And Lum'a Al-Itiqad, which is the book that we're going to be looking at. That was the approach that Ibn Qudama used for the methodology and authoring that text. The second approach is like the first approach, except that it employs intellectual argumentation to refute innovated ideologies and not a means to establishing doctrinal issues. They would utilize ilm al-kalam in order to refute al-mutakallimin. They would jump into that maidan al-kalam and take their stuff and then they would use it to refute them. But they wouldn't use that theological uh, rhetoric or that approach to establish doctrine. They would only rely on what was transmitted in order to formulate the doctrine of Islam. They did not restrict themselves to reported terminologies. So if you look at Luma, for example, which we're going to look at, and you compare it to Qala'id, which we looked at, along with a couple of issues, especially in the introductions of Qala'id versus Luma, in Qala'id there's a number of issues that are not mentioned at all by Ibn Qudama. And then there are terminologies and arguments that are used in Qala'id. You'll hear words like Al-Jism and Johar and Arab. These are all terminologies that were uh, coined by Mutakallimin. Um, and a Hanabila of this particular approach, they would utilize those words and those arguments in order to refute them. And they were called Mutakallimi al Hanabila. And they can be found throughout the three eras of the Hanabila as well. From Abu al Hassan al Tamimi, this was uh, his way, and uh, the general approach uh, to Aqidah for Ahl al-Tamimiyun. Also, Al-Qadi Abu Ya'la utilized this. He was Min al-Mutawasitin and Ibn Hamdan. And by default, Ibn Balban from Qala'id al-Iqiyan and many others. The intellectual evidence that is not in agreement with revelation is not utilized by this particular approach. So they would only go as far as the revelation would allow them to utilize this particular approach uh, of debating uh, the, the mutakallimi. And this can be found in books like Al-Idah Fi Usul al-Din, this is by Ibn Zaghuni, uh, Nihayat al-Mubtadi'in by Ibn Hamdan, as I mentioned, and Al-Ain wal-Athar by Abd al-Baqi al-Mawahabi. And so these books, along with the previous ones from the first initial approach, they're all recognized as authoritative books in the doctrine of the Hanabila. So throughout the eras, the, Hanab the Hanabila, they differed regarding the ruling of utilizing ilm al-kalam. They differed from the very early, most of the early generations, they disapproved and deemed it impermissible. And they did so based on a narration from Imam Ahmed, which states, whoever utilizes kalam will not succeed. So they used that statement from Imam Ahmed to say that it was impermissible. And Imam Ibn Qudama was a, a, a rather uh, strong force in opposition to ilm al-kalam. Um, and those who approved of its restricted use, remember there are some restrictions here in using it, such as Al-Qadi Abu Ya'la and his Shaykh Ibn Hamid and At-Tamimi, as I mentioned, relied on the narration of Hanbal, which states, meaning Hanbal is related from Imam Ahmad, we initially ordered, Imam Ahmad said, we initially ordered silence, but when we were called to that which there was no escape from but to defend and to clarify, to negate what was being said, Basically, we had to. We had to say something. 
So it was mentioned by Al Khalal that Imam Ahmad's ruling of it being impermissible was abrogated. And so you'll find that not everybody agreed with this, from the Hanabi, of course. That was a, a difference of opinion that remained uh, throughout the, 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 mm, these three eras, if you will. But I think the important conclusion here is that um, while the approach is different, the aqidah of the Hanabi is, is, is the same. The approach that use is different, but the aqidah that they had was the same. Even though you might find here or there some of the great imams of this school that they may differ, they may have you know, gone a little bit this way or that way, in a few issues, uh, regardless of the approach. So uh, the, the, uh, what they considered the mutahadithin min al-hanabila, some of them differed from the majority of the mutahadithin. They, they ended up with a different conclusion. And then al mutakalli min al-hanabila, some of them ended up with a different conclusion outside of what was considered al-mu'tamid or the, the relied upon uh, doctrine. And the reason that I mention this and have harped on it here um, more than might seem necessary is because we've studied Qala'ad al qiyan We've done that already. And that is from the books which utilized that approach. And if you were there, you would say, I didn't see anything really wrong with it. There might be some words there you didn't recognize or like something a little bit new, but Otherwise, the end result was essentially the same. And now we're going to look at Luma, which is going to utilize a different style. And so you may see and feel some contrast. But eventually, you'll note that the issues, they're all essentially the same. Uh, so in Usul al-Din, he authored Al-Burhan fi Mas'alat al-Qur'an. He authored Al-Iatiqad, Mas'alat al-Ulu, Dham al-Ta'wil, Kitab al-Qadr, Fada'il al-Sahaba, and Tahrim al-Nadr fi Kutub. Ahl kalam. So there you go. That last one, tahrim al nadr means the impermissibility of another, meaning to read uh, uh, the books of Ahl kalam. And that is, of course, utilizing, I mean, we can cont contextualize that. You're not going to go looking for your doctrine or your aqidah in the books of Ibn al kalam. In the field of hadith, he authored Mukhtasar uh, uh, al ilal Mukhtasar al ilal of Al Khalal and Mashaykh uh, Shiyukhina. So these are like um, Ilal, we know, uh, we understand Ilal is like issue, de dealing with some of the sciences of hadith in terms of the, the grading of the hadith and it's uh, what's behind all of that. And then Mashaykh uh, Shiyukhina perhaps is about narrators of hadith that Imam Al Qudama came in contact with. In fiqh, he authored Al Mughni fil fiqh, Al Kafi fil fiqh, Al Mughni fil fiqh. Mukhtasar al Hidayah, al Umda, Manasik al Hajj, them al Wiswas, among numerous other epistles and edicts which are Risal and Fatawa. So um, you can see um, his, his library of, of works in this particular field is quite expansive. He had like a curriculum of sorts, and it was a gradual in its progression. It was kind of a book he wrote for beginners, and then the intermediate student, then the advanced student, and of course the expert. In the fields of Usul al-Fiqh, he authored Rawdat al-Nadr. Rawdat al-Nadr is like, it's the book in Usul al-Fiqh for the Hanabila. Like Al-Mughni Kanaf. He authored works in the field of Zuhd such as Kitab al-Tawabin. Kitab al-Tawabin is a book that we've, uh, I've often referred to during the khutbas. Beautiful book. It's about the repentant. It's a bunch of stories about those that have repented, some of the greatest imams of the past, and their uh, path to Tawbah. Kitab uh, Al Mutahabina Fila, Kitab Al Riqa Wal Buka, Fadl Ashura and Fadl Al Ashar. So, here are a number of other books in this particular field. Those that love one another for the sake of Allah. Kitab Al Riqa means softness and buka and tears. Fadl uh, Ashura, which is the virtue of the day uh, Ashura, and Fadl Al Ashar, which is the 10 days. He also authored several books in linguistics and lineage. He, uh, his works benefited the masses, as you might imagine, in particular the scholars of the Hanbali school. However, as I alluded to, um, the scholars of the other schools, they would find al mughni to be um, unique. And some of them would, would use it as a reference. And it's used today frequently um, as a reference point for the various different, like, intra-medhab uh, studies. Um, so al hafidhiyah 
he said, I saw Imam Ahmed in a dream. And he mentioned an issue in fiqh to me. Al-Hafidh Dhiya, Dhiya Uddin, Al-Maqdisi. He said, I saw Imam Ahmed in a dream and he mentioned an issue in fiqh to me. I said, this issue is found in Al-Khiraqi. And he, radiallahu anhu, said, your companion Al-Muwafiq has not fallen short in explaining Al-Khiraqi. Remember, Muhtasar Al-Khiraqi has over 300 commentaries. But the dream Imam Ahmed mentioned, Muwafiq al-Din al-Qudama, out of everyone else that had serviced that work. al mughni received such tremendous praise from the luminaries of the tradition that poetry was written about the book. <laughs> he has numerous students who learned and benefited from him, such as al hafid Abu Ishaq Ibrahim al wasati Ahmed ibn Ibrahim al-Maqdisi, Ahmed ibn Salama ibn Ahmed al-Najjar, uh, his grandson al hafid Abu al-Abbas, Ahmed ibn Isa, and Abdullah ibn Qudama, al hafid Diyauddin, We've quoted from him numerous times in this brief biography. And Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahid al-Maqdisi, his nephew Abdurrahman ibn Muhammad ibn Ahmad ibn Qudama and others. His nephew Abdurrahman ibn Muhammad ibn Ahmad ibn Qudama is known as Ash-Sharih. Ash-Sharih. So whenever you're reading Sharh al-Muntaha or uh, Kashaf or any of the books and they say Qal Ash-Sharih, they're talking about Abdurrahman and Muhammad ibn Ahmad because he obviously a student of Ibn Qudama wrote the explanation, a uh, commentary on al muqni which was authored by um, Ibn Qudama, and he used al muqni to do so. He used his uncle's work to do that. Yeah. Ibn Qudama passed away at his house in Damascus on Saturday, day of Eid al-Fitr, year 620 of the Hijra calendar. His funeral prayer was held the following day, and his body was taken to Mount Qasiyun in Salihiyah, where he was buried. The funeral prayer was packed the point that people were standing on the mountain. Ismail ibn Hamadi said, on the night of Eid al-Fitr, it appeared as if the Mus'haf of Uthman had been removed from the mosque of Damascus and raised to the heavens. I was overwhelmed with sadness. Then Al-Muwafiq passed away. Uh, ibn Qudama, he was married to his paternal cousin, Maryam bin Abi Bakr, and Abdullah bin Sa'ad al-Maqdisi. They had a number of kids. Had Isa, Muhammad, Yahya, Sophia, and Fatima. Then he married Izziya, uh, who died before him. All of his sons died during his lifetime, and none of them had any offspring except for Isa, who had two righteous sons. However, both of them died without any offspring, and so the Sheikh has no remaining progeny. And that, in a nutshell, is uh, the life uh, of the great Muafiquddin ibn Qudama. رحم الله تعالى